Today we're taking a look at the Splatch Twin Plus. It's an electric scooter that retails for around £900 and it's a lot of scooter for the money. The Twin Plus has dual 600 watt hub motors, dual suspension and a 15.6 amp hour 48 volt battery pack. It also claims to be able to hit 28 miles per hour in less than 4 seconds, which would make it the fastest accelerating electric vehicle that I've ever tested. It's designed to sit somewhere in the middle ground between your average commuter scooter, like the Xiaomi M365, and a full-on beast mode scooter like the Cabo Wolf King GT. It weighs in at 24 kilos, so it's not exactly light, but you can still lift it with one arm. It also folds down to be surprisingly compact, thanks to a retracting stem and folding bars. This means it's not too much of a struggle to get into your car, and if you're using it for a commute, you can tuck it away under your desk pretty easily. The Splash Twin has been around for a little while now, but the Plus is a new version of this design. The fundamentals remain unchanged, but this model replaces the Twin's solid rubber tyres with traditional air-filled tyres. They're also a bit larger, at 8.5 inches, compared to the 8-inch solid ones. This means that it gives you a much more comfortable ride, particularly when it comes to uneven surfaces like gravel tracks. It should also corner better, as the softer tyres can shift and grip the road better, reducing the chances of an accidental skid. The downside to pneumatic tyres is, of course, the fact that you can get a puncture. And I got one during the course of my testing, but we'll talk more about that later. The other difference with the Twin Plus is that it adds a new NFC keycard locking system. You get three supplied cards in the box, and you can attach one to your keyring with an elastic cord. Every time you turn the scooter on, you'll need to tap the card, otherwise it won't do anything. It's essentially the same as having a key to start your scooter, but the advantage with this option is that you don't have keys dangling from the lock barrel and jangling as you ride around. In practice, it's worked well. It takes a little longer than I'd like to recognize the key card, but it's worth the slight inconvenience for the added security that it brings. Speaking of security, the Splash Twin Plus has another nifty little security feature up its sleeve. There's a little compartment on the stem that looks like a reflector, and it's designed to stow an air tag so you can keep track of it. I'm not an Apple person, so I didn't try this myself, but I can see the appeal. And hey, if you don't use air tags, you could always hide your weed in there. But you didn't hear that from me. The Splatch Twin chassis is an OEM design, which means it's not exclusive to Splatch, and you can find essentially the same scooter from different brands. For example, the Evolve Terra appears to be the exact same as the standard twin, and there are quite a few similarities with the VSET 8 Plus too. The big difference is the price. Splash is one of the cheapest options, making it the obvious choice. It's also the most fun brand name to say. Splatch. So that could factor in as well. The deck is nice and wide at just under 8 inches, and it has a rubbery grip pattern applied to the top. I love this as it's grippy enough to keep you in place, but it's also much easier to clean than standard skateboard grip. And since this scoot has the ability to handle some off-roading, you'll likely want to rinse it off every once in a while. The rake of the handlebar stem means that you stand quite far back on the deck, and I found it most comfortable with my back foot up on the footrest handle type thing. Thankfully this piece is extremely solid and definitely up to the task. The suspension is a relatively simple spring and bushing based system. You can adjust the preload, but there's no dampening like you'd find on a mountain bike. It works well though, even with me on it, and I'm right at the top of the recommended weight range. The brakes are drum brakes on the front and rear, and I was a little nervous about them, but they work better than I expected. The brakes will easily lock up the wheels if you want them to, and they're very low maintenance and easy to adjust compared to disc brakes. The brakes are assisted by electronic regen by default, and the standard setting is pretty intense. I chose to disconnect the rear lever sensor, so the electronic braking is only applied with the front brake, and I much prefer it this way. It means I can apply the rear brake while I'm cornering, and not go flying over the bars. If you go into the settings, there are three different modes you can apply to the electronic brake. Off, weak, and strong. It's on strong by default, and I turned it down to weak, but even then, it's quite jarring. I think a lot of riders might prefer to disable it entirely. There are white lights at the front of the deck and red at the rear, and these are joined by a transparent acrylic rod, which means that the sides glow red when riding at night. When you brake, the rear lights flash, and therefore, so do the sides. The lighting looks alright, but it's not the most impressive effect. I would have loved to see an actual light strip used on the sides, but this is better than nothing. If you ride at night a lot, you'll definitely need to supplement these lights with some handlebar mounted lights if you want to see where you're going, and be seen by other road users. 
The folding mechanism is pretty robust and confidence inspiring. You pull a large lever to fold and unfold the stem hinge, and there's a metal stub that rotates into place as a failsafe. The handlebar stem is height adjustable with a standard quick release lever, and the bars fold down for easy transport. The whole folding process can be achieved in just a couple of seconds, and it can be carried in the folded position too, as long as you've eaten your wheat and bigs. You may have noticed that one of my bolts is black and the other one's silver. This is because the handlebar bolts came super loose on my model, and I managed to lose a bolt within about five minutes of setting it up. It's my fault really, I should have checked them, but I do think they should have Loctite on them from the factory, and they don't at the moment. So if you pick one up, please please ensure these bolts are tight. If you lost one at speed, it could be a pretty horrific sight. Oh, and if anyone's looking for these bolts, they're the same size as rollerblade wheel axles, so they're quite easy to get hold of. The scooter has two displays, one by the NFC reader that gives you a simple battery voltage readout, and a more comprehensive one that shows you your speed, battery level, and modes. It's a pretty standard display that you'll find on a lot of other scooters, and it gets the job done, but it's quite hard to see while you're riding, especially when it's in direct sunlight. Elsewhere you get two dual position switches, one switches between eco and turbo, and the other selects dual or single motor drive. The throttle is a trigger type, and it's my first time using one of these for any extended period. I still think thumb throttles are easier to modulate your speed with, but this works well too, and it's certainly safer than a motorcycle style twist grip. Right, with all that rambling out of the way, let's see how the Splatch Twin Plus did in our tests. The Splatch Twin Plus claims to be capable of achieving 35 miles plus on a charge, but you know how these things work. That's with a lightweight rider on a flat path, probably using single motor eco mode. I'm six foot two, I weigh around 230 pounds, so I'm expecting much less than that. If we can get close to 20 miles, I'll call that a win. The most important factor for me is whether we can make it to the city center and back with battery to spare. That's a 12 mile round trip, and there's plenty of hills to contend with in both directions. I was confident that the Splash could handle that, so on the way in, I decided to test out all the different speed modes that this scooter has to offer. There's a lot of them, three basic speed modes in dual and single motor, as well as eco and turbo for each, making 12 in total. The modes affect both the acceleration and the top speed, with the eco modes accelerating much slower across the range to limit battery draw. I tested with a GPS speedo app, and the onboard display proved to be quite accurate as well. It takes a while to show off every mode, so let's run through a quick summary of each. Starting with the single motor modes, speed mode 1 in Eco does 7 miles per hour with very leisurely acceleration, and 10 miles per hour in turbo. Mode 2 Eco does 12 miles per hour, and turbo will get you up to 18 with slightly better acceleration, feeling a little bit like a Xiaomi M365. Mode 3 Eco does 16 miles per hour, and turbo got me 24, but the hill climbing ability was still pretty naff. Switching over to dual motor mode, speed 1 in Eco does 8 miles per hour ish, and turbo does 14. Mode 2 Eco gets you to 12 miles per hour, and turbo gets you to around 20. Finally, mode 3 Eco does 16 miles per hour, and turbo unlocks the full power, which gets you to 28 miles per hour, and does so pretty quickly. With a slight headwind and a bit of a tuck, I measured a 0 to 20 time of about 7 seconds and 0 to 28 time of about 11. The funny thing with this scooter is, it'll happily carry my heavy ass up hills at 25 miles per hour, but it won't really go past 29 and 30 even on a downhill, which makes me wonder if it's limited in some way. In any case, this is more than fast enough on 8.5 inch wheels, and even though it does feel plenty stable, I don't think I'm in a rush to go much quicker on a scooter like this. Right, yeah, so back to the range test. As you can see, we've not been taking it easy on the throttle, and that theme continues throughout the rest of the ride too. I even took a few gravel tracks, which probably aren't that easy on the battery either. I mainly stuck to bike paths, and I averaged around 16 to 20 miles per hour for most of the trip. But there was a few on-road sections that I couldn't resist opening the throttle on. We ended the ride at 15.2 miles, and after sitting for a second, the battery recovered to 45 volts, or about 20% remaining capacity. We could have kept going, but I had other stuff to do, so it must end there. I'm confident that I could squeeze an extra 4 or 5 miles out of it, which means it'll do 20 with a heavy rider in mode 3 with dual motor. If you whack it in eco and ride sensibly, you'll be able to go much further, but that's not why you buy a scooter like this. So who really cares? 
the hill climb test is a little bit unnecessary on this one. I've already taken this scooter up extremely steep inclines and I know it performs well. But for the sake of comparison, I took the splash to the same hill that I've used to test the skateboards that you've seen on this channel. It was no surprise that the Twin Plus annihilated the competition. The previous fastest climber, the X1 Max, looks like a snail by comparison. And this even beats my 52 volt DIY e-bike up the hill. Hill climbing ability is definitely one of the strengths of this scooter's design. The Splash Twin Plus isn't really designed to be an off-road beast. It has street tyres and pretty small wheels. But thanks to the dual motors and the dual suspension, it does handle it pretty well. It's most at home on hard packed dirt and gravel paths, but if you need to cross some grass it'll do that too. It's less fun and a bit bumpy, but the same could be said for most electric vehicles really. Going off the beaten path and over some rooty rocky single track, I was surprised to find that the Twin Plus took it all in its stride. There are some limitations of course, mainly due to the low deck clearance and the small wheels, but this little scoop can handle a lot more than I was expecting. All right, with the tests out of the way, let's get into the pros and cons. Here are the things that I liked. The first one's the acceleration, it gets you up to speed really quick, and it does so in a smooth and controllable way. It doesn't jerk you about. It's just a really nice smooth ride. The hill climbing, this scooter isn't phased by even the steepest of grades. It'll carry you up any hill you can find at 20 miles an hour plus. The comfy ride, the dual suspension and air filled tires make this a wonderfully smooth ride on pavement. And when you go off road, it's not too shaky either. The portability, it packs down surprisingly small. And it means you can chuck it in a car, or carry it up some stairs without barely breaking a sweat. The range, it goes plenty far enough for my needs. It's nothing too wild, but I think most people will be more than happy with the range that this scooter has. And finally, the price. As I said at the start, it's a lot of scooter for the money. As for the things that I don't like, the first one's the charge port location. It's up next to the front wheel, which is fine when the scooter's folded, but when it's unfolded, someone walking by could easily knock the handlebars and then the wheel would hit into the charge port and that just wouldn't be good. I think it would be much safer if the charge port was on top of the deck or on the side. The slow charging it takes about seven and a half hours with the supplied adapter and at the moment there doesn't seem to be a quick charge adapter sold separately either so you really have to plan ahead when you're going for a ride. The tyre change. As I mentioned earlier I got a flat tyre during the course of my testing which is no big deal, it happens, but I wasn't quite prepared for how much of a task it would be to change this tyre. It should be easy in theory. There's a quick disconnect for the wire and there's a split rim design which means you just undo some bolts and the tyre should come off pretty easily. But it just would not budge. After lots of hours of sweating and fairy liquid I got it off but I'm not in a rush to do it again. It was so much of a pain that I think if you're doing mainly on-road riding you should probably consider the twin original instead just because it's got solid tyres and you'll never have to go through that ordeal. The loose bolts, as I mentioned earlier my handlebar bolts came super loose and I lost one. It's not the end of the world, just make sure you tighten up your bolts, but it does lower my confidence in the QA testing because I do think they should have Loctite on them. But yeah, what are you going to do? So should you get one? Well, if you've got about a grand to spend on a scooter and you're looking for speed and comfort, I think this is probably the best option that I've come across. It goes exactly as fast as I'd want it to, but I can still just about lift it with one arm, which is really nice. If you want to do some off-roading, it handles that way better than I expected it would. And if you're not, then yeah, consider the original twin, as I said, you won't get a flat that way. But I do think you'll have a much rougher ride if you're going off-road. So that's about it for this one. As always, links to everything are down in the description. And if you like this kind of thing, hit subscribe because I've got loads more cool stuff on the way. Yeah, until next time, toodles.